Um, so welcome everyone to today's workshop, Water, Tourism and Peace, a Bali case study. Uh, just a friendly reminder that the workshop is being recorded today. So I wish to pay my respects to the Awabakal people whose land on which I'm meeting with you today on. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and recognise that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, this is a beautiful adnate um, graffiti um, from one of the buildings in Wickham, but unfortunately I don't think it exists. So um, I'm hoping it'll live on through my... <laughs> paying my respects to Awabakal people. Hello and welcome. We're just, just underway. Uh, so today we're going to take a look at water, tourism and peace uh, with a focus on Bali. I've divided it into three sections. So the part one will look at tourism. So a little bit of background on tourism in Bali, um, a current look of uh, the impacts of uh, Bar uh, tourism from a local perspective, uh, as well as uh, looking at connection um, and the power of connection and what that means for tourism going forward. The part two will look at water. So water as a source of life and a more general broad terms, um, as well as so look into Bali's water crisis and understanding what that means. Uh, then I'll finally introduce you to uh, the concept of water stewardship um, and how that might apply in our uh, local setting. Then finally, we finish up on looking at peace. So um, while peace is a very broad and complex area of study, uh, I'll attempt to give you a, a, defi a definition of that. And then finally weave together the concepts of tourism, water and peace um, nearly together. So at the end of the workshop today, we'll take a moment to reflect on uh, what you'll learn. So if you do have any questions, comments, or wanna share any thoughts, please just jot them down and we can explore that at the end of the session today. So over the course of the workshop today, I hope you gain an appreciation of our neighbours in Bali. At Core Ethics, we believe that education is the key to unlocking opportunities to solving some of the most pressing issues uh, globally. But before we get started, I'd like to get to know who is with us today, uh, where are you calling from and what motivated you to join? Uh, so I'll hand that over whoever would like to go first. Yep, I can go first. Um, my name's Jess Miller. I'm actually not on a Wabakil country. I just haven't changed my name thing. I, I do live in Newcastle normally. I'm just up on Bundjalung country in northern New South Wales, locked down up here. Um, yeah, I'm just here to learn, really. Um, my big thing is biodiversity conservation and um, also power dynamics and, and how how different, I, I guess this is of interest because it, it might feed into my mental model of how um, power relations in other countries work, given we have this growth model that is killing everything. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> yes, we certainly do touch on uh, the role that civil society, government um, and industry have to play. Um, and that this conversation is an open conversation for all to participate in um, and that, you know, we, we all have a role to play and, and it shouldn't be left to uh, either sector of uh, society. Thanks, Jess. Anyone else brave enough to go? I can go if you like. Sure. Um, my name's Sahani and I'm living in Melbourne and I just wanted to know more about this workshop and learn a bit more about Bali and their tourism. That's just where I'm coming from. Thanks, Sahani. Hi, I'm Georgie. I'm in Newcastle. Um, and yeah, I'm just interested to hear more about um, sort of the topic for today. It ties into some things that I'm studying at uni at the moment. Um, I'm doing law and science with some geography development studies type courses. So I'm interested to hear, um, yeah, how that might tie into some of those things. Fantastic. Thanks, Georgie. Thanks for joining us. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, David here. 
So um, I do a lot of activism and I'm just interested in um, interconnectedness. Yeah. And I, yeah, I'm just fascinated by putting water, tourism and peace together. And, and I'm, I'm guessing maybe, although you'll address them individually, there's certainly overlaps and points of like a, a, a web, I guess. Absolutely. Thanks so much for joining us. Anyone else? I'll have a quick word. My name's Nigel I'm, and I live in Charlestown near Newcastle. I'm mostly in my life about energy and renewable energy and such. Um, but of course, I'm always uh, interested to broaden my perspective. So, of course, water is an important part of the world. So here I am, it's just to learn. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us, Nigel. Hello. Hello, I can hear someone faintly. Can you hear me? Very, very faintly. Uh, I don't know how to fix that. Shout louder. I'm guessing that might be Melanie. Yes. Yes. trying to be able to chat. So I can see, yeah, your microphone's not working so well. So you're working in tourism, um, Indonesian programs, and thank you for running a workshop for me. I live in Lake Mac. Fantastic. Yeah. That's excellent. So a bit of context. So hopefully, um, yeah, you might be able to share um, a bit at the end as well um, after, you know, taking it all in and integrating it with your experience and um, being able to contribute to the, to the chat at the end. So thanks so much for joining us, Melanie. Faintly hear you. Um, so I'd like to introduce myself. <laughs> no problems, Melanie. Um, so my name is Melissa McKay, but I'm the founder, chair and CEO of Horror Ethics. By way of education, I have a background in international studies, majoring in global politics and peace and Indonesia. In 2017, I undertook uh, research in Bali, Lombok and Sumbawa uh, into the impacts of mass tourism on water depletion and pollution and land rights. So this included desk research as well as field research. Uh, my working background, I've worked in public, private and charity sectors across law, health, finance and marketing. And as well in my volunteer experience, which, you know, for a lot of people, I think uh, spearheading their um, role in environmental and social change, um, volunteering with uh, Take Three for the Sea, Boomerang Bags, Amnesty International, as well as Refugee Action Committee in Canberra. So that's a little bit about me. So a little bit about core ethics. So core ethics is an independent, all volunteer run not-for-profit founded here in Newcastle. Uh, core ethics partners with community led ethical organizations to support innovative projects that create sustainable and thriving communities in the developing world through advancing education and the natural environment. So this is quite a broad statement that we look at. Uh, our current uh, program in Bali, Indonesia, encompasses uh, some of these things, but we see some of the impacts of tourism on water and land uh, is almost a, um, a template for us to move further afield. So while we recognise some of these issues that we'll get into today in Bali, uh, the same things are happening right across Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Malaysia. So unfortunately, um, this case study that we'll be focusing on can be applied um, further afield. So the four pillars that we stand upon for our organisation is sustain sustainability, equity, empowerment and ethics. So that guides our organisation. So let's take a look at part one, tourism. 
So in this section, we'll take a little look about uh, tourism in Bali, a little bit of a background, uh, as well as the local impact on the people there and the environment. Um, and then looking at connection and the power of connection and how that might transform Bali. Bali, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? So we'll just go around and off the top of your head, don't need to think about it too much, but what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Definitely um, tourism and people going there for schoolies and holidays and things like that. Mm -hmm. Pre-COVID at least. Yeah. I'm just thinking of a really good holiday with Bali. Corn rose. What was that, sorry? Braids and corn rose. Braids and corn rose. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Yeah, same with me. This is my first overseas holiday at the age of 21. Thank you. <clears throat> Lots of colour and um, exotic, you know, cultural stuff that I hadn't been exposed to being yeah. in a very white Australian community. Yeah. Anyone else? Melanie, it would be interesting to hear your, your thoughts on that. Just typing in there. I guess um, I'll jump in for a sec. Um, yeah. I guess never having been to Bali, um, the only things I really know about it are that a lot of Australians like to go there and have beach parties. Um, so I, I kind of associate uh, Bali in particular with, um, I don't know, there's a, a similar sort of feeling to when uh, British people would go over to Mallorca and have their uh, beach parties there. Um, it's a certain certain type of person will go over there and have their parties. But, you know, having not been there myself, I uh, that's, that's obviously a, a biased opinion of mine. Do you think that's influenced... Uh perhaps you going there or not going there? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, because uh, I'm, you know, I'm the kind of person that likes to go somewhere that is um, not a touristy uh, sort of area, somewhere that, you know, typically, um, you know, some a Westerner would go there and just be a, a nuisance. Um, I'm, you know, I prefer to be able to go somewhere and just like, you know, observe this is how the culture is and this is how things usually are without some uh, foreigner coming in and being a nuisance, basically. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's a really important uh, sentiment, I think, to talk about today um, because it is something that is stopping this conversation uh, between Australia and Indonesia. Um, so I really want to bridge that gap. So thank you so much for raising that. Does anyone else want to um, share their thoughts on Bali? Thank you, Melanie, for popping in the chat. Bombing scares me. Okay. So that's some of the external threats. Melissa, I also went spent some time in Ubud and in other parts of Bali where there was there were no people that um, uh, understood or could speak English, and accidentally ended up there, <laughs> and it was hilarious. Like suddenly it being outside of our cocoon of um, white privilege down the south and yeah. looking at making gesticulations with me and my boyfriend and going, "Okay, we're screwed here," and actually <laughs> not even realizing we hadn't even come with any understanding of how to get around with a map. So. Okay. But Ubud was beautiful. There's a real um, spiritual kind of um, a, an equanimity that I could sense there. And yeah, 
I wanted to stay. I ended up spending most of my time there actually. And I've had friends say that they've gone and lived there and that that's a very tempting proposition. Yeah, especially now. Well, given my, minus the COVID. Thank you so much. Great points. Um, and it's so great to hear a, a diversity of reactions to uh, Bali. And I guess the point of this activity was to understand that uh, the dialogue around what Bali means to Australians, uh, which you'll find out in the following few slides, um, is, is so different. Um, and we need to really all come onto the same page about um, our sentiments for Bali. So tourism in Bali. Uh, Bali is one of the smallest provinces in Indonesia. It's located only 2000 kilometers from the north of tip of Australia. Indonesia is the largest archipelago in the world with an estimated 17,508 islands. However, researchers are not in agreement with the official number. Uh, still, pre-COVID annual tourist numbers um, sat in the millions, Aussies being in the top three uh, alongside Chinese tourists and uh, English backpackers. In the first quarter of 2020, Aussies recorded 225,000 trips to the island of the gods. We love it and we loathe it. Um, and I think that really comes through with some of the comments that um, you guys brought forward. You know, for some people, it's this beautiful luxury uh, holiday paradise. Um, but for others, there is a sense of, you know, it's, it's a bit abused. Um, it, it's completely run over by uh, Westerners, uh, you know, I, I guess when some people are traveling to the developing world, uh, they're looking for that authenticity um, and that local approach. Um, so a part of this is um, reframing the way that we, we look at Bali and the way that we value Bali as well. But looking back to Bali's origins, Bali first became known to the world in 1932 after a visit by Charlie Chaplin. At the time, only artists and actors and famous types could afford to travel there. Later, surfers became to discover and mingle with the locals. Even further back than that, Bali was a major uh, destination for trade, uh, where it would welcome visitors from all over the world. Bali's hospitable charm still echoes today. 80% of Bali's economy is derived from the tourism industry. And despite research warning Bali's tourism sector and provincial leaders about the high risk they run, putting all their eggs into one basket, so to speak. The sector continues to expand and develop. More villas go up, more hotels, more pools, more roads. On the flip side, long-term damage is created without resist. More rice fields are replaced with concrete, food demand outstrips supply. If you've ever eaten a nasi goreng in Bali, chances are you've eaten rice from Vietnam. The overdevelopment of Bali, such as such a fragile and small island, is placing immense pressure on its carrying capacity. On the slide, you'll see an image taken from 1932, which depicts more of a village style uh, dirt roads. Um, and this image taken last year of uh, the increase of hotel development across the island. So from my research in 2017, there are two points of view on tourism in Bali, and these correlate to the le level of education attained. For example, participants who recorded elementary education as being the highest level attained believe tourism brings many economic and social benefits, like having a job and making friends with foreigners who believe they, them to be kind and respectful. On the flip side, those with a university level education identify tourism as unsustainable, citing the growth of hotels and villas in the south, increase in buses on already haphazard roads, creation of a take economy attitude among travellers at the detriment of environmental and social needs. And then there were some local participants who weren't really concerned about tourism at all. They saw the strength, resilience and preservation of Balinese culture which is still so strong today. So apart from witnessing ceremony through the streets from temples lining the beach, how are people, local people impacted by tourism? Consumption and waste. 
As a developing country, Indonesia lacks sufficient waste management infrastructure, which overwhelms land, rivers and oceans around Bali. Everything that is consumed by a tourist during their stay does not go through the same process that we are so fortunate to have here in Australia. It just adds to the waste burden. Local communities that rely on river systems uh, for their daily needs are met with a plastic soup. From available research, we know that consumption levels of tourists are excessively higher than locals. This sentiment is echoed in the image, tourists, your luxury holiday, my daily misery. This photo was taken in uh, Barcelona um, in Spain um, and during the time was quite an uproar across the world um, about the impact of tourists on local communities um, and that included a range um, of issues including um, the rise in, in cost of living um, due to the money coming in from uh, developed um, country tourists um, as well as you know the, the lack of local resources to go around, um, all sorts of issues. So in 2017, I spoke with a local woman who thought that the government could do more to educate not just the local people, but visitors to unconscious consumption. Um, and this is a big part of why our core ethics exists. We recognise there's a gap between um, education around, uh, you know, where you are travelling to and the importance of understanding some of the local issues that exist uh, before you go and ways that you can uh, contribute to um, a, a better society. Culture. Local families in the north of Bali who have for generations worked sawa or wet rice fields are losing their children to the tourist south. So areas like Kuda Semenyak, Changu, Sanur, lured by the excitement of young people coming from all over the world and to earn a lot of money. As one father told me, my goal is to keep younger generation in the village and not have to leave to go to Kuda or Sunur. He feared that the younger generation will sever their connection with the land, their culture and fail to protect for generations to come. Workers' rights. Unfortunately, the glitz of working in a beachside bar or hotel is not at all what it seems. For many young Indonesians living in remote neighbouring islands, they will save for years to afford a ticket to Bali in the hope to make a better life for themselves and to send money home to their families. Foreign-owned businesses have accelerated with the growth of tourism, and this not only diverts money away from local communities, but can also take advantage of their vulnerability. One woman in her 20s I spoke with told me of her experience when she arrived to the island. She was presented a work contract in English and was forced to sign it. She did not understand the contract and said she felt bad, uh, but had no choice. She saved for so long to get to Bali. She did not receive any pay for the first three months and had nowhere to live, moving from park bench to beach to street multiple times a night for safety. Eventually, a kind soul noticed she was sleeping by the beach and offered her a job and bed in a cos, which is a dorm style hostel. Unfortunately, this is not an isolated story and Indonesian workers are often underpaid or unpaid with little to no rights. Unfair advantage. Local business owners feel the brunt of the exponential development and increase in foreigners starting businesses on the island. A Wurrung owner told me, as tourism grows, many buildings, more business means less for us. The sentiment eat local, something that we support here in Newcastle, is certainly something to be prioritised when travelling in developing nations. If you quote, so this is a quote, if you always see something beautiful and everybody is seeing this beautiful woman, then eventually she becomes a cheap because she's so easy to be with. Bali needs to be exotic, keep her prestige and not fall into a place of cheap. This is a recount from a young local woman who describes how we all need to rethink Bali's value, who was once upon a time when Chaplin voyaged the island, a beautiful exotic place. Connection. There is no doubt tourism in Bali has impacted the lives of local people and their natural environment, but there is a silver lining to this story. 
Tourism has an incredible ability to bust through language and cultural ballot, uh, barriers, an ability for us to deeply connect with other people, to care and to show empathy. Think about your last trip overseas. Do you remember a time you befriended a local person, that you connected with them on a deeper level? Perhaps it was even a gaze that lingered that made you feel deeply. Do you still keep in touch? And what about the bracelet they gifted you or that time a local helped you find your way as you arrived in a foreign land? Globalization has made it pre-COVID, of course, even easier for middle income countries to move around the planet. Unfortunately, it has not been so successful in spreading wealth around the world to places where it is needed most. Disparity still exists. We can, through tourism, realize better outcomes for vulnerable communities in the developing world. If we just take the time to educate ourselves on our impact as tourists and build connections that foster peaceful relationships, tourism as a vehicle can be a pathway toward peace. Part two, water. So in this part, we will take a look at water as a source of life. Bali's water crisis and introduce you to the concept of water stewardship. Um, sorry, I just noticed on this on the chat. Um, the slides are working okay. Okay now, thanks, Nigel. Sorry, I missed that one. So, so water is the source of life. Water is an incredible life-sustaining source. Us humans depend on it to live, to eat, and to practice cultural rituals. Non-human species depend on it to live, to eat, to thrive. Right now, we need to ensure we have water in balance with human activity if we are to reduce the impacts of climate change. Water covers 71% of the Earth's surface and 97% of this is found in our oceans, while only 3% is attributed to fresh water. Of this 3%, 2.5% of the Earth's fresh water is unavailable to us and is locked up in glaciers, polar ice caps, the atmosphere and soil. It is either highly polluted or lies too far under the Earth's surface to be extracted at an affordable cost. That leaves only 0.5% of available fresh water for us. That means we must protect this precious and finite resource. Bali's water crisis. Take a look at the map on the screen. The areas shaded red show where excessive exploitation of water source resources occur compared to availability. What's more is these areas directly correlate with high tourist numbers and where we see rice paddies replaced by hotels and villas. Alarmingly, 75% of Bali's available water source is used by the tourism industry. So we can begin to see the correlation between tourism and water and how important it is as my role to educate and spread awareness far and wide. Water scarcity. In 2012, Dr. Stroma Cole in her research found 60% of Bali's watershed was declared dry. In just 10 years, Bali's water table had dropped by 50 metres. This research has pr provided the basis for many not-for-profits and yayasans in Bali and across the world, including core ethics, to design effective responses to the water crisis. It is estimated that the average tourist will use approximately three times more than a local Balinese during their stay. When you consider the type of luxuries on an island getaway, including swimming pools, showers and baths, then add a poor infrastructure and water regulations, times that by 10 million visitors a year, you start to see how Bali has become to reach a crisis point. Water pollution. On top of Bali's water scarcity issue, what available water sources they do have are heavily polluted. The map on the left shows areas across the island where salt water intrusion into the table has been found. Again, we can see an alignment with those red dots and popular tourist destinations. Salt water intrusion is a result of excessive withdrawal of fresh water compared to replenishment rates. Salt water intrusion is not reversible. As a solution, this means the potential reliance on desalinated water, which if this situation is not addressed. 
you might think that this fix is simple, but this becomes a cost to accessing water, which drives a line between the haves, those who can afford desalination technology, and the have-nots, those who cannot afford it. In my research, I found cases where this divide echoed, where the haves could afford to drill deeper into the water table to extract clean water, versus the have-nots who relied on hand-dug wells only to access dirty, polluted water. This inequity in access to clean water is a primary driver of Core Ethics Water for Bali project. Access to clean water is an international human right that all people on this planet should be afforded. The image on the right is a picture taken along Tukad Barung, the main river artery that runs through Denpasar city. The colour comes from a locally owned factory who had discharged chemicals into the river uh, as a result of textile dyeing process overnight. These small cottage industry businesses lack the resources, education and infrastructure to transform their practices for the betterment of workers, health, job security, local environment, and importantly, to protect their catchment area. In 2016, 21 rivers had pollution levels ranging from minus 30 to minus 70, with zero considered a safe level, both due to domestic and industrial wastes. You can read more about this on our blog. This lesser known water pollution issue is the driver behind Core Ethics Waste for Wealth project where innovation and education can transform social and environmental outcomes for the local people. Water stewardship. According to the Alliance for Water Stewardship, water stewardship can be defined as the use of water that is socially and culturally equitable environmentally sustainable and economically beneficial, achieved through a state inclusive process that involves site and catchment based actions. Good water stewards understand their own water use, catchment contexts and shared concerns in terms of water governance, water balance, water quality, important water related areas, water sanitation and hygiene, and then engage in meaningful individual and collective actions that benefit people, the economy and nature. So what does that, this mean for you? What can you take away from this? We must at all levels, civil society, industry and government collaborate and work together toward a more nuanced approach to water management. After all, water is universe, universal. No matter where you are, whether it's Bali, Zimbabwe, Barcelona or Newcastle, we all have an intrinsic role to play. We also often play multiple roles in the water stewardship dialogue. We belong to communities and we belong to workplaces. Perhaps you're in a position of influence, you know someone who is, or a family member. We can all play a part as water stewardships by starting a conversation in our circles about water diving deeper through education and innovating the ways, the old ways of doing things and being an, into a new way of thriving in balance with nature. So let's take a quick look at peace. In the final section, we'll take a look at peace and then weave through uh, all the three concepts that I've introduced. Peace defined. Peace is a complex area of study that offers a useful lens to the field of environmental and societal security. While we do not have time to explore this in detail, I'd like to introduce you to the concept of peace to help bring together the importance of water and tourism. Conflict. We cannot talk about peace without looking at conflict and you'll understand why as we move through points two and three. Conflict is inevitable among beings in shared settings where common interests meet finite resources and different interests lead to incompatible activities. It is normal and expected from an individual le level right up to a global governance level. Conflict can be both bad and good, bad because it can lead to misunderstanding, hostility, alienation and violence. Good because it can be a stimulus for creative thinking and development of new ideas new technologies and new forms of social interaction. Positive peace. Drawing on Adam Curl's definition, positive peace is the presence of a state of affairs that is beneficial for all parties in relationship. Negative peace can be defined as the absence of violence and this can be physical or psychological as well as the obvious armed war and that includes the threat of armed war. 
When we talk about peace among nations, that is the absence of violence, we are referring to negative peace. Weaving all the concepts together. So it is clear that there is a link between mass tourism and water stress exists. International affairs experts warn that conflict over water will occur in the next decade if we do not pay attention to the warning signs and act in unison. Right now, Bali exists in a state of negative peace and is vulnerable to instability in the region, in our shared Asia Pacific region. We can do more. Through connection, particularly when used in conflict resolution process for common ground, we can reach new innovative ways of solving issues affecting local communities. We must strive to create better balance for our travel hosts to ensure they benefit from our overseas holiday and not just in purely economic terms, but socially, environmentally and culturally. So that concludes my presentation, but before I go, I'd like us to take a moment to reflect on the information you've received today. Uh, in a moment, I'd like to go around the room and hear from you. What will you take away with you today? What is something that you've learnt? Do you have any questions? Perhaps it struck an emotional chord with you? Has it given you any drive to do something? What is that something? Maybe you're ready to take action or wanting to connect with our organisation or perhaps someone in your own circles. So I'd love to hand it over and hear from you all. Um, I'll go first briefly. I, I think um, there's definitely a lot of really interesting um, new and important information for me that's sort of making me want to um, look into these issues a bit more and Bali and as well as other um, tourism focused sort of countries um, like understand those issues a bit more and look at what I can do in you know if I'm traveling or if people I know are traveling or um, yeah being more conscious of um, the impacts of that and thinking about yeah how that impacts local communities so that was really really interesting thanks mum. Oh, you're most welcome. So great to hear. And it does. It, it starts with individuals having conversations and, and talking about these things. I know a lot of people shy away from the Bali conversation, um, but from the research I uh, did, you know, by far Bali is reaching a crisis point. And, you know, as we speak now, they're in an economic crisis as well as their water there's a lot going on there but um yeah until we inquire and understand um things will continue to persist thanks yeah, so much right. for joining me that, um, sorry the figure with tourism being 80 percent of their economy like i i didn't realize it was that much it's just so high and with covid you can totally understand how that's creating another crisis there so that is really sad to hear yeah absolutely Um, thanks. Thanks for that, Melissa. Um, so, of course, over the, you might have briefly mentioned it, but overlaying all of this yes. is the climate and ecological crisis. And I guess like um, those places, it's um, having a, an effect upon um, rainfall and that sort of thing. So, um yeah, yeah, and extreme weather events, I guess, is yes. what I'm saying. So this yeah. uh, this this will overlap and um, what um, hype up or bump up the the um, the risks. Yeah. So um, I guess the the wet seasons coming in sooner um, and the the dry periods are becoming less frequent. Um, Melanie in the chat talking about. Um, overtakes monsoon supplies, storage is a huge issue. So the more that tourism has expanded, which means the more hotels are developing. So essentially you're covering that land and the potential capture of that rainfall um, with concrete. So where did it all run off to? Into the ocean. Um, so a part of what Core Ethics does is we look um, and support IDEP Foundation um, in Bali. So they're building recharge wells and this has been used right across the world uh, really successfully in India um, where drilling into the table 
Um, they've mapped out the island where the most rainfall is, um, so that can start to replenish. Um, but at the same time, you know, we need to be doing um, education. Um, regulation is obviously an issue in Bali with corruption, um, but educating businesses to get on board, uh, to rethink their consumption. Um, essentially, we want people to stop excessively drilling into the table to accessing because there needs to be a replenishment stage. And interestingly enough, COVID has, you know, what some are saying, the gods are talking, <laughs> you know, it's cut tourism out. So it's allowing the, the island to replenish, um, which is really fantastic. But unfortunately, there's an economic fallout where people aren't eating. Um, but thank you. It's really great connection, absolutely. Anyone else before we... Um... Before we wrap up, um, the, the second, we, unless someone else wants to go, I was just going to quickly ask: Is domestic, yep. is internal Indonesian tourism picking up in Bali? It and is. is. Is that in domestic tourism to Bali quantitatively different from Western tourism? Absolutely, They're completely different. But it's also um, in a social psychological way. Um, for some reason, Bali has become um, so attuned to the international tourists that it is actually not realising um, the positivity in domestic tourism. Um, so there's a call for Bali to reframe the way it looks at its domestic tourists um, because they have not stopped throughout COVID. You know, um, the provincial government have said, this is fine, we need um, money coming through. Um, so we'll allow as long as you're vaccinated and you have your test and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's a good time for Bali to perhaps pivot um, and start looking at domestic tourism as a way, um, as a way forward. Um, because I mean, they've got a, a huge, huge domestic hinterland, you know. <laughs> yes. And yes. You, you'd think that they could just stand yeah just be just giant just on the domestic stuff and they could forget about us foreigners <laughs> yeah for now <laughs> yeah. And yeah. i was just wondering are domestic indonesian tourists different from international tourists in their behavior yeah or is bali so unspeakably you know a, a hindu culture in the middle of a islamic and christian nation yeah, it's interesting, actually, um, that there's certainly a lot of value, but of course, domestic tourists will do very different activities to international tourists. So perhaps the way that Bali's established itself doesn't speak to a domestic tourist. And I think there is a call to um, cater more for domestic tourism, um, yeah, other than, long. you know, hotels and pubs and bars and all that sort of stuff, especially when you consider the religious um, element of that as well. Yeah, because I was just thinking for the Christians and Hindu, uh, Muslims in uh, wider Indonesia, Bali is an exotic culture. Yes, yes, it, in itself, in itself, mm. um, which I think, yeah, that there's a lot of room to grow there and I hope to see it grow, um, domestic tourism. There's a lot of money in Indonesia. Just needs to be spread, spread around better. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll better leave it there. Otherwise, I'll yep. cut into everyone else's um, time. Um, but thank you so much. Um, if you're keen to learn a bit more or um, jump on one of our workshops in the future, um, you can check us out at www.coreethics.net. Um, lots of ways to get involved subscribe register for our, our monthly newsletter you can donate or volunteer we're always um updating our volunteer positions um and all remotely as well so thank you so much for joining us today and thank you. Uh, that's inspired you to learn a bit more about bali enjoy the rest of the um thank you hey thanks guys bye-bye thank, thank you melissa you're welcome bye